Hi folks, you're very welcome back to the afternoon session of Mayo Dark Sky Festival 2020. Um, and thanks a million for sticking up with us throughout the day. We've now reached the halfway point um, and I'm very excited about this next event. Um, dark skies are not only important for the realms of astronomy, physics, archaeoastronomy and archaeology, but also for the terrestrial environment and the wildlife that resides on Earth. For this afternoon session, I am delighted to welcome two incredible speakers who are renowned each in their own right for their work in the areas of conservation, environmental protection, botany and ecology. Um, Dara McAnulty is a naturalist, environmental activist and astute writer, having published and launched his first book, Diary of a Young Naturalist, right in the middle of the current pandemic. His work has not only caught the attention of well-established naturalists like Chris Packham and Rob McFarlane, but his book has also won the Wayne White Prize for Nature Writing in this year. Um, Dara has become the youngest writer also in history, long listed for the prestigious Bailey Guilford Prize, um, which celebrates astounding non-fiction writing in the UK. And he sits there alongside 12 other finalists with his first book, in Ireland, this book is also running for the Unpost Irish Book Awards, and this really is only the beginning for Dara. Um, on the right-hand side of him today, there will be Aina Nilauna. She's a renowned botanist, conservation advocate, and radio presenter. Absolute, um, I guess, um, familiar voice in Irish audiences and homes across the country. She's been on the panel of experts on Mooney Goes Wild, um, has been president of Antashka and is the current president of the Tree Council of Ireland. She's heavily involved in environmental education and public engagement and has written numerous books on wildlife throughout her career. Um, these were Talking Wild, Wild Things at School and Wild Dublin. And she is due to publish a fourth book, Wild Word from the Birds and the Bees, the Boglands and the Ice Caps in March 2021. So with climate breakdown and biodiversity loss at the forefront of issues that need to be tackled, not only globally, but also on a local level, it is really fitting that we have these conversations. And on that note, what better people to get these conversations started than both Aina Milana and Dara McAnulty. Um, so just to hand over to you there, Aina, it's great to see you today. Um, thanks for coming on board. Dara, absolutely love the poster in the background. That is just going to pounce at us at some stage, I'm sure. Um, so at this point, I'll hand over to you, Aina, and uh, we'll get the conversation started. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. I hope you can all hear me. And um, it's great to meet you, Dara, and yourself, Marina, and the apparently more than 150 people who are out there listening to us as well. Isn't that great? And I want to um, join with Marina in my congratulations to you, Dara, for your being the youngest ever winner of the RSPB medal, for winning the Wainwright Prize for UK Nature Writing, and indeed, you're shortlisted now for the Irish, on post-Irish National Awards too, there's, there's, there's three categories that you're shortlisted in, so it's all good, they really like your book, it would seem, isn't that great? Now, this book, this book, The Diary of a Young Naturalist, it chronicles the year that you in, that you wrote about from the equinox in March right through to the equinox the following year. In other words, last March 2020, it finished. And you start off the year living in Fermanagh and then by the end of the year, you're actually moved and you're living in County Down. So you, you chronicle how um, the wildlife that you see changes from Fermanagh, where you're very familiar with it, to um, County Down, where you're beginning to learn about it. But you've always been interested in this, and you can remember vividly your earliest encounter with wildlife, which was when we were introducing the red kites to Ireland way back in the year 2008 to Northern Ireland, and you got interested in red kites. Tell us about it, Dara. Uh, Kim, um, thank you, Ina, for um, talking to me. It's, a, it, it's always been lovely to, to actually talk to people about these very, very important issues. And thank you, um, Marina, for letting me on anywhere. <laughs> We're delighted um, to have you. It's our pleasure. <laughs> um, and yeah, the Red Kite Project was the first um, project I ever got involved in or saw um, it was, I remember coming in, I was, sorry, there was a hair on my screen. <laughs> I remember, um, 
the RSPB. Um, people came into my school, uh, my primary school, and I was, so I must have been like P3. It, it was a long time ago. Um, and I remember just sitting there completely entranced by these majestic birds in this reintroduction project of bringing them back. And it set up, uh, set up a lifelong joy and love of birds of prey. And that carries on still to today. And I've always found it um, um, almost poetic that where I'm living now, I'm looking at the moment um, outside of the back door um, straight into a forest park which is where they were originally released, which um, I kind of came almost full circle in the sense that I've made it to the place where those creatures that um, captured my imagination all of those years ago um, spread um, uh, where they were released. And uh, it, they are magical birds and every single time I see them, I get really, really excited, even though I see them um, at least once a week, every single time I see them, I go, <laughs> <laughs> they're fantastic <laughs> to see. They've just got such a distinctive shape in their tail and it, it, they're just beautiful. They are beautiful. In fact, you, you are very, your love of the birds of prey really comes out in your book. I was just looking at it there, buzzards, kites, kestrels, a peregrine in a starling murmuration, barn owls, the, all these birds of prey are the stars of your book. And of course, the highlight when you went to Scotland to ring the goshawks. Tell us about that. That was the reward, wasn't it, for well, your, one of your earliest endeavours? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was the, basically the training for how to implement a satellite tagging project because um, for satellite tagging birds of prey, it's a bit complicated because you've got to make sure that it doesn't harm the bird and you've got to be able to put it on properly. And so we went, um, uh, I went with uh, uh, Dr. Ema Rooney and Kendrew and Dr. Kendrew and to go and look, um, we were going to like our training session and it was probably one of the most surreal experiences of my life. And it was one of the first things in the book that I was, wrote about um, was the goshawks. Um, um, when I was, when I, like when I was doing it, I like the spring came from uh, the blog entries and the um, a, a diary. And then I remember the first, time when I realized that this was turning into a book um it was the goshawks that I was writing about and I remember uh, coming across on the ferry and it was really really stormy about two o'clock in the morning <laughs> so you had the moon shining down uh, glinting off the waves and I was just sitting there sort of in the in the cubby of a window on the on the ship, on the ferry, and just uh, with my little notebook writing. And it's a memory that's stuck with me because I can't really sleep, at, you can't really sleep at two o'clock in the morning. Like you've already woken up and you're sort of like, and I just remember writing. And it, it, it did um, set me up for one of the greatest experiences I've ever had in my life of staring into that goshawk's eyes and seeing that depth and intelligence and life that I had never really experienced before. Um, and, <sighs> and it all stemmed from a project where I had, um, me and my mum had raised uh, 6,000 pounds for uh, satellite tagging buzzards and red kites. Um, I think we had sore feet like, a year afterwards um, from it, but it was very much worth it. And yes, yeah, so Birds of Prey have been for me all, all my life and have been that anchor that I've 
basically required to that spurred me forwards um, into conservation and activism. Yes, I mean, reading your book and the way you speak, you would think that you are a zoologist. And I was reading along, delighted that but all this material about animals. And then I fell in love with you even more when I read when I read this 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 little line in it, how you are a lover of ivy. Now, I'm always singing the praises of ivy and, you know, people say it's an infestation. It's a terrible thing. It's strangling everything. And you might as well talk to the wall as try and convince them otherwise. And there were you. And I could have said, this is great. This man actually loves ivy. So come on, let's hear it for the ivy. Oh, yes, ivy. Like, I, it always has annoyed me when people uh, destroy ivy because apparently it's strangling the trees. It's like, trees have been living with ivy for like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and they don't seem to be dying of it. <laughs> like, and, and the flowers, um, they don't really look like flowers, but they are flowers and they provide very precious resource of um, nectar for insects that go on later into the winter and that you, they, they, they rely on the ivy for survival because all of the other flowers that are around in the summer aren't there anymore. And so the basically only food source is the ivy. And when you cut down ivy, you're wiping out a whole generation, a whole um, area of um, insects. And ivy is a beautiful plant. It makes you... It's cosy as well. I've always thought it, it feels, uh, it, it kind of twists around um, buildings and trees and makes everything feel wilder, I do think. It, it makes things feel uh, special. It does, and it's part. It's part actually of the native fauna, of the native flora of Ireland. Now, I lectured for years in in DIT in Bolton Street, third level students, and I brought them at one time to Denmark. We were on a field trip, and the woodlands there have no ivy, Dara, and it's amazing because they're the same kind of trees, the same sort of deciduous woodland as here, but it's too cold, too dry. The conditions aren't right, and you're looking through the woodland and thinking. What's wrong with this woodland? Why doesn't it look like one at home? And it's the lack of the ivy. So ivy yeah. isn't abundant everywhere at all, not mm, the least. Special. So it'd be, it'd be a habitat like that that people just spurn. Yeah. It's appalling. I, I'm delighted that you're a champion of ivy. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, it, it is an incredible and it allows for that um, very, these, it's the reason why we get it. Um, some of these insects further on in the year than some other places because is singly because of ivy, and I, I just find that absolutely incredible. And of course, there's berries on the ivy in February. Yeah, and there's and berries the with the birds. And it, it is basically just the um, food source for all of the creatures of the forest. Absolutely, indeed. Now, I was just reading, reading through your book and looking at how you describe your adventures out of doors. I mean, you seem to experience the world very intensely i mean not just seeing things you see the finest you notice the smallest detail you hear you hear practically butterflies wings that perhaps don't sound to our ears at all but you can feel their feel the sound of them you describe that very beautifully touching things the actual feel of them as you touch them and of course the smells of everything as it rises up do you think that's a particular um blessing if you like that's a particular gift that you have or have you developed it or does does it just come with the territory is that Dara McAnulty? Um, I, I think it, it might have something to do with me being autistic and me feeling everything that little bit more intensely because um, I don't really know how anybody else's minds work but is from what I've got from the information that I've gathered I, I think I do feel the world that bit more intensely and it, it, when I go out into a forest, it envelops me and the touches, the smells, um, the feelings that you get off par bark and occasionally the taste, um, the taste of the air. Like every single place has its very specific, um, I guess it's like a sense, sensory 
landscape with its own peaks and um, rolling hills and valleys. And you can sort of, and I can sort of, it like sprawls out in front of you. And I think that's maybe why I find the human world so distressing at times, because it's like looking out upon a, a place and it's so twisted and unnatural and so unreal that it just blows every circuit in my brain. And I, I, it just, my brain just like, no, no. <laughs> don't like that, no. Don't like that. You'd, you'd never, you'd, you see so many people doing this. I never do it, but I'm sure you don't either. Go out with headphones on and music in the headphones, extraneous music, something else when you're outdoors. What do you think of that for a, a way of going on? It doesn't really make any sense to me because sound yeah. is a, a part of um, how we experience the world. And like the only possible excuse I can give for that is if there's loads of people there and it's really noisy and you can't hear anything and you just want to live inside your head for a while out in nature, then, okay, that might be an acceptable. If, if there's like thousands of people there, like that's, that's the only excuse I'm giving you to put anybody to put on headphones out in nature. But if you're by yourself, listen to it. It, it, it has its own harmony and orchestra of all of these different notes and harmonies that build up into this um, this whole symphony of sound that on top of the other senses like smell and touch and even I think how cool it is or how hot it is, all of this sort of works into your brain and gives this overwhelming sense of relaxation that I do find because it's where I it's where I think um, humans have evolved in forests and out in nature and it's where we're, we're it's where we're more, most comfortable um, like only very recently do we have sprawling cities or shopping centers but nature has been there all the time and I think that we do we do need it. It, it is deep-rooted in our minds, that need to go outside. Given that we're talking, Dara, at a Dark Skies Festival, maybe yes. we should we should Sorry. reference the night. Because certainly yes. um, humans have developed, as you said, they've evolved. They've evolved with their eyesight. I mean, they're a daytime species, generally. They, they gather together in groups. We stood up to see further. Those of us in the northern hemisphere, far north, have blue eyes. We don't need the brown melon in our eyes to be able to see further without the light of the sun damaging our eyes. So if you take away the light when it's dark, when it's dark at night, even even plebs like me, our, our hearing, we seem to think, improves more because we're concentrating on our hearing. Do you go out at night much or is that is that hearing overload for you? Is it all sound then? Do you miss being able to see or can you see in the dark? Um, I, 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 I've actually found that I um, see my eyesight is not very good. Um, <laughs> well, um, full stop. But I can, I've got decent um, dark and um, night vision, which is yeah. which surprises me <laughs> quite a bit. I'm not entirely sure why that is, but I can see quite well in the dark. Um, <laughs> so I I love being out at night because one of my favorite creatures is bats, and they only come out at night. So <laughs> I, I I I do have to um, be out in the dark for them and. I think that there, it's almost like a, a double, it's a bit of, I feel like it's almost paradoxical sound at night. It feels quieter, but also louder at the same time. I feel like you can feel um, the difference, I, I think, between that. There's no, I, okay, I'm going to speculate within my, I do this, I will go on random tangents. I feel a tangent coming on. <laughs> um, Go for it. So I think that possibly because during the day we've got this constant background noise. Is it maybe maybe it's from cars? Maybe it's from people? Maybe it's just the low rumble of the day, and at night that disappears. And 
So you've got so you had the this almost middle rumble that's kind of thing, but now you can tell more of the difference between the noise and the silence, and so everything feels a lot more quieter. But then when you hear a noise, you can pick it up perfectly because there's no other distractions. You can't really see very well, so that's not distracting you.、Um, it's colder, so the heat isn't really distracting you either. And I think you're a lot more、um, open to your senses at night. And、um, uh, this is me going on a complete tangent.、Um, I may be completely wrong about this, <laughs> but this is I, I, this is why I, I, I do feel、um, when I'm out at, at night time. I, I, I think. It, Does that make sense? Yes, that makes <laughs> it sense. does. I was just thinking. We used to do.、Um, I used to do underwater diving when I was thin enough and young enough to fit into my wetsuits. And one of the really high spots was to go on a night dive. Now you go in under the sea in the dark, and boy, is it dark down there! And you can't hear because we're not whales. There's not much sound when you're just off the coast. And you can't see because it's dark. And now you have two senses gone, and it's all touch. And if you inadvertently touch against a bit of seaweed or something, you jump out of your skin. You think something's <laughs> attacking you. So it's amazing as you shut down、yeah. one sense and another sense, how the next one becomes even more yeah, vibrant. It's really. So anyway,、really、I don't know whether you want to take up underwater diving or not. But <laughs> wouldn't mind. I've never, I've never been diving, so I like. <laughs> Why you're not dead yet? You could take it up. Anyway.、Yeah. Listen, <laughs> To, I want to move on, Dara. You're,、yeah. you're going to be hard on adults, many of whom you see as in conflict with nature, and and you're dead right. I mean, the adults who who、um, make the decisions about the world. I mean, do you feel patronised when you you know when you meet them? You know, when you go to make a presentation or a speech, and these people have the power to make the change, and they're not doing it. You don't think much of the adults, do you? Really, and I don't blame you. But just tell us what you tell us what you think in that respect. Okay, so <sighs> where do you begin?、Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I, it's with adults. I think that there's so it's. I've always found it hard to group everybody into adults into a box, but there's some. People and sometimes politicians. I will not name names,、um, and they just seem to be like, do you not care about anybody else's future here? Because like, you might be dead and gone by the time we're inheriting, us young people are in, inheriting this world, and it's really. <laughs> I completely I, I understand that, where you're coming from. I think、yeah. that I think that noise is <laughs>、um, <laughs> kind of articulates the emotions that happen every single time you sort of try and engage with some people. It's like you gotta like take a deep breath, and like every time I see something that really distresses me, or someone says something that's so ridiculous. That it makes me so angry. Like I have like a like a, a three day cool off period. It like it, it does affect me quite badly whenever these sort of things happen.、Um, but I do think that attitudes are beginning to change、um, to young people and to nature.、Um, and I and I do hope that it can improve in the future because we 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 need everybody to like they. It is the adults who will make the decisions、um, to, of the next generation, and we've got to. We, we've shown them all of the these reasons why this world is so beautiful and so wondrous, and is worth saving. And now we feel in the sort of limbo of waiting,、um, because. We seem to have done everything that we possibly can to show, to eye open, to make awareness, and now it's up to them to put in these decisions. And then you just now, and then you just wait and see the time ticking past, and it's infuriating. 
Well, it is. I mean, your book has, like many another book, but this one in particular, The Diary of a Young Naturalist, it has greatly increased awareness among the readers of the world that they inherit. And they know bloody well that we have 10 years left. I wish they'd stop yeah. saying that because that kind of infers, well, we can wait another 10 years before doing anything. I mean, by the time 2030 comes, it's too late. I mean, yeah. hopefully, hopefully uh, a vaccine will come for COVID and COVID will yeah. be in yeah. the history books in a year or two's time it can be fixed but it doesn't seem to dawn on people that you can't take a vaccine for climate change you can't just invent something that'll fix it everybody has to get dug in and they got dug in they're getting dug in they're acting as a group for covid albeit reluctantly but it can be done so yeah why do the people who vote vote in leaders that won't make decisions that are good for the planet I mean, you don't know, and you know, know. you're young, <laughs> but I don't know, and I'm old. I mean, what yeah. are we doing, you know, heads up against the wall like this? So just to hop in there as well, um, both Aina and Dara, we have a few comments and questions coming in from the chat side of things and the questions and answers. So a lot of people looking at the sensory side of walking outside at nighttime and saying that we really don't appreciate how heightened those senses become. Uh, and a lot of people in agreement there about those senses at nighttime being much more alert and aware. Um, Dara, you're very inspired by nature, and I think that's coming through quite a lot. You're extremely passionate. Um, and just a question here from um, Jed Dowling um, says, Dara, you're a great ambassador for the natural world. Would you consider doing talks to promote this appreciation to your own peer group? Um, and also, did you appreciate the quiet time during lockdown? in terms of wildlife, I guess, in that sense. Okay, so I'll, okay. Um, I'll, I'll start with the first question about considering doing talks. Um, yeah. At the moment, um, we're in lockdown, and so that means I can't <laughs> um, at, the, at the moment. And I, I really um, do, I do intend to be doing that. Um, and doing talks to schools because I, 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 I've, it's seeing um, children and young people um, showing them the world and seeing their eyes light up at the wonder of it all is, it, it's a, seeing that gives you hope. And I, at the moment I have an eco group in my school that I set up um, and it it gave me a way to sh it gave me actually more confidence in myself that i that it is possible that i can show people who may not have even um looked outside um yeah uh, with some uh a wonder with the outside world and now they're seeing it with uh a new light and that, that, that gave me so much hope when I saw that. It made me so happy inside um, that it basically strove me forward for the rest of the book. <laughs> and I think that is one of the turning points in the book is when that eco group is set up. And because like before that was kind of a bit, kind of a bit gloomy, <laughs> um, to say the least. Um, and it, it's... Educating young people, I think, is probably one of my favourite things, yeah. um, aside from being in nature, to do. Um, and uh, about the quiet time of lockdown, well, sadly, I live beside a road. And even in lockdown, um, the road is still whizzing by for some reason. <laughs> so that was very annoying. <laughs> um, but I remember going out into the forest park, which is... I'm very, very lucky with the fact that it's only a five minutes walk away. Um, I know not everybody is that lucky, but it was, it was amazing. I, I, I think I know every single inch of that place off by heart now. Um, I remember seeing these two red kites. Uh, sorry for going back on the red kites again. They, they, they keep on turning up. As, we love them. Um, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they were wheeling overhead and I got some really cool pictures of them and they were that I think that set my lockdown uh, <laughs> kept me going for a good few weeks after that 
Um, but it, it was tough because I couldn't go out and explore new places and see, um, because I'm still learning about this new place that I'm living in. Yeah, I've only been here a few years, uh, two years, and I'm still a bit uncertain and shaky on my feet. I'm still trying to discover and find new places. I was, um, I was looking in your in your book for um, what happened on Halloween in the part of your book that you were writing oh, yeah. the thirty first, and you were out walking on 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 a walk, but you were in a hurry at the end because you were going to look at a starling murmuration, and it's just yeah. the time of year because on the last, I was just came in at the end of the previous talk, and there was a plug for what might be happening in the sky in November and December. Mm -hmm. Well, now let's give a plug for what might be happening in the sky in the world of wildlife, yes. and you describe that starling murmuration, which is at dusk, it's starting to get dark, the starlings are going to bed, but they can't just go to bed like anybody else. They have yeah. to have this carry on first. This I know. <laughs> flying carpet, it's like magic. I mean, and it doesn't happen everywhere. It hardly happens anywhere. And it doesn't happen in the same place every year, except, of course, on the bridge in Belfast. That, that it always, just beside the yeah. railway station, it always happens there on that bridge. But mm. this flying carpet of, of starlings that you were going off to see on Halloween when you wrote the book, probably not this time last year, probably it was that you were looking at. Tell us about how you experienced the starling murmuration and explain what it is to people who may not, in fact, be familiar with the Dara. Okay, um, so I think I've seen one, like, I think large enough to be considered a proper murmuration once in my life. And that was the one in the book. <laughs> and it was Brilliant. the best thing I've ever seen um, because there's a peregrine there, which makes everything better. Um, and I, uh, it was, it, it, because I think the, the thing that you can't really realize until you actually see it is how loud it is. Um, a starting murmuration is, it's so loud <laughs> because of all of these wing beating, wing beats. And you've got hundreds, maybe thousands of wings beating. And it's like a roar. And I, I remember we were, we, funnily enough, uh, we were going to see red kites. <laughs> God, they keep on turning now. <laughs> um, and we did see red kites and they were amazing. Um, and we were coming back home and we, we know that there's meant to be a starting murmuration um, at uh, Schlieff Crew, where um, the so they kind of murmurate quite often around that area, and it was incredible. Like, uh, it's trying to find the because it's like a geometric pattern that's like waving and like a a black mass that sometimes little areas of it become lighter and then darker as different densities of birds are in a certain area and then they're looping and twirling and none of them seem to bang into each other, which I always found absolutely incredible. That you've got like, thousands of birds in a massive clump, like a, um, a fish shoal, and none of them are bumping into each other because that would be catastrophic. Um, there's a bit of science in there with... Um, how they align their um, wingtips with each other and that uh, if one moves the entire flock moves with them um phenomenal the whole area of yeah, and of course the whole thing is that they all move yeah. as one organism yeah, even though there's so... all these. and it only happens it only starts to happen now because we don't yeah. have enough starlings in ireland and as the winter comes we get in you know the, the starlings from mainland europe the starlings from northern europe where the ground is too cold for them to feed come to Ireland so not only can you hear their wing beats but if you could listen to what they were saying Dara they're yeah. probably speaking in Swedish and they're speaking in Russian yeah. and they're speaking in Finnish yeah, yeah. because they're they're coming from all these places now they look the same as our Stalins if you call it one but and this this you wonder who's in charge who decides to go here or who decides to go there and it just lasts very long and then they all drop down and suddenly they're gone but but it's a great thing and this is something to look forward to now as the, the, the nights get darker because the murmuration will happen early enough. And people people with all this 
communications with, with phones can tell each other where these things are because it doesn't seem that humans interrupt them. So no matter who goes out to look at them, that's not going to make it go away. You can disturb other things by being there, but you can't really disturb the Starling murmuration by going out to look at them. So no. I, I heartily recommend it. Oh, yes. Absolutely. And just um, coming back to the chat and the questions there again, We've got lots of people saying that they've also enjoyed murmurations. So out in Blackpool on the piers in Blackpool, um, someone said, Peggy, I saw one before and I heard of them and it was absolutely spectacular. I had stopped the car and looked at them in awe. Um, we have a lovely question here as well from Terry Mosley, who was on the talk just prior to you. Um, he said, great enthusiasm, Dara. Well done. And to be honest, we're only mentioning a small fraction of what you've achieved. You've also got the BBC Springwatch Unsprung Wildlife Hero Award in 2017. And you got, you're judging currently Country Files for the photography competition there. But Terry asks, do you find many others of your generation share your enthusiasm for nature? So that's question one. And then kind of following on from that, how would you encourage other people to protect nature um, using that enthusiasm? Okay, then. Um... I think that a lot of young people, um, more than a lot of people realize, um, love nature because I, I, I think that there's a misconception because sometimes um, I, I found this through personal experience that um, young, some young people um, feel awkward about it or um, don't really feel um, that it's normal um to be uh to to like going out in nature and love nature but in reality i found it's so many young people are so enthusiastic about nature once they begin to um experience it and i've always had the firm belief that all children are born naturalists and we spend, uh, and it's all, um, if parenting, I think parenting has a huge difference in how you experience the world because um, one of my most despised things in the world is when uh, a child picks up an acorn or a conquer or a feather and the parent says those eternal damning wor words, that's dirty get away from it <laughs> great <laughs> stemming uh, basically just cauterizing any sort of growth or any um, imagination or going out into nature because it's apparently bad evil or dirty which obviously it isn't <laughs> but I do think that if we, if parents change their attitude, and even if I think almost saying nothing is better, um, because the world is so beautiful that it cannot, it can't be dirty because it, it's the most pure thing there is, and for well. I have been out and mucking around in nature for 14 years. No, it's 15 years now, I'm 16. Uh, <laughs> and on. I have not once encountered um, a strange muck-related disease. Um, Agreed. I haven't... Yeah, uh, I know, because I, I, I have a letters. radio program. I've had it for 25 years, before you were even born, Dan, I feel yeah. like. And um, people used to send us in things physically in envelopes, and yeah. now they send in pictures instead. And usually it's, what is this, and how do I get rid of it? What is this, and what will it do to me? Now, I wouldn't mind for myself, but my child might find it. My child might. And, I mean, the children that find these things are delighted with them, and the yeah. parents takes it off them and says, don't touch that, go away from that. And then you can actually end up giving your child a phobia if that, somehow yeah. your mother is terrified of something that you can't see why it's 
why it's afraid. I mean, why would you be afraid of a frog? But if your mother is terrified of a frog, there must be some awful unseen evil that you don't know about. So, exactly. you know, kids come to school at the age of four with all these phobias already in place, which they get at home. So we never yeah. answer anything about what it is. We might tell them what it is, but right. we always say we're a wildlife program, not a wild death program. We never tell them how to get rid of it because that's not our breed. Exactly. So like, you're, you're dead right. It's the parents that are given the wrong yeah. attitude. Sure. Like I, I, I dissect um, owl pellets with my bare hands. Like <laughs> I feel like yeah. it's, it, it, it. There's nothing. Re as long as you wash your hands and don't um, eat anything that could be poisonous, you're going to be mostly fine. Like <laughs> it's as long as you're not um, going out into the forest picking up a random mushroom and eating it. Uh, then you're going to be mostly fine. <laughs> yeah, because they get sick with anything else. I mean, if you eat awful berries or something, you'll vomit them yeah, up. Like if you, well, if you eat a bad mushroom, you know, that's liver damage. So I but we won't endorse either the mushroom or the you berry. Don't any mushrooms now. Yeah. Or any, bear, <laughs> or any <laughs> random berry. Stop there, go, look yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because if you're going to eat anything, make sure that you know what it is before you eat it. <laughs> well so, so you can tell you can tell the state pathologist when they're doing the dissection on your body yeah indeed <laughs> so you, you've become an activist now for for yeah. um the world that we live in you you Greta Thunberg is a great is a great mm -hmm. hero of yours you you've been on school strikes do you feel a responsibility by being an activist that you are now actually taking it into your own hands to do something is this not a, a great responsibility Dara yeah, and sometimes I feel like this responsibility being forced upon young people almost um, makes me feel, okay. <laughs> um, it's sometimes it's like, uh, how, what percentage of the population is young people? So if like, it, it can't be more than 20, 25, 20 to 25% 25 of the population are young people. And yet the responsibility has been shifted on us. Absolutely. And that has always felt a bit weird with me. It's like, but you're, so you're the people who cause this problem. You're the majority of the population, but we've got to solve it <laughs> um, with no power. Um, that's felt always, that responsibility, it, it feels um, almost like the impossible task sometimes, doesn't it? And it's funny, you should not have to take that responsibility. And I guess coming from a place where I've seen for the last 30 years of my life that people have been the same, always leaving it to the youth to make that decision yeah. or make that change, whereas now we don't have the time. So if you were to say, if you had a platform right now for adults to say what you would like them to do, what would be kind of the top things you would like to see people in a position of making change doing for nature right now? I, I want to see um, adults taking a more active role um, in preserving our natural environment because I know many amazing adults who um, are shaping the world through conservation and activism, but it, we feel like a minority here of, and that it, it's almost most young people and then a smaller, it, it, it feels really imbalanced. And the people who we really need um, to see how, the, why these changes are so necessary are politicians. And uh, it's, and then you go into this constant tug of war uh, with between um, politicians and lobby groups and who gets what and um, the economy and economics and then everything gets watered down and then you feel like, have we done anything? And then it's just, and then you go back to the beginning of the circle because you still know that you need to do more and then you've got to go for the entire thing again and you never, and then you get to the same result as you got in the first place. And then you're like, ah, uh, where do we even turn now? And it, the people who sh seem to be the people who sh should be making the these changes aren't. 
Yeah. And it, it, it saddens me. It, it, it really does. And it makes me ache inside. But I, I, I still have hope. I, 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 need... I must say, um, you talk about one-fifth of the people being young, but there's a whole other cohort, Dara, the grandparents. I mean, I have three grandchildren at the moment, yeah. and grandparents in particular are at the other end of the spectrum, yeah. I'm sorry to say, but they're the ones that see the importance of it because they can see that their grandchildren will inherit a different world. And the grandparents, perhaps the older grandparents, it wasn't their making. I mean, in the 1940s and 50s, plastic hadn't even been invented. I yeah. mean, we got school bags made of leather and we had the same bloody school bag for the whole of our school days. We never got a new one because it never wore out. So the, the grandparents, and of course then lots of, Lots, I mean, all the parents aren't terrible to their kids and take them in and say everything is dirty. I mean, more and more parents are taking their children out into the wild and learning with them what they didn't know themselves, learning together. But the grandparents are a whole resource that we should tap more. They vote. They actually vote. Young, parents, young people under the age of 18 can't vote, but the grandparents can. And I think some hope, some some aspiration, some some positivity has to be handed to the to the grandparents yeah they certainly have also i mean you speak you speak very nicely and very powerfully about your own grandparents in in your diary yeah. and how much they know about the world and that that is a given mm -hmm. yeah and the um these um grandparents have seen so much of the world they've seen it change um every, like they, I'm, I've only been on this world for 16 years and even I'm starting to notice changes from when I was um, a small child to now. And then you think about um, maybe someone who's lived for 90 or 100 years, all of this change that they've seen. And it's, it really does um, make you... Um, think it's all of this um, because things are very different from how they were in the 1940s, 50s, uh, 30s, 40s, 50s. It's, a, it's almost like a completely different world. Um, there's social media. You can basically travel across the world, although not at the moment, um, in a day. Um, you can base it. it the, everything is so much more interconnected now than it was a lot more complicated as well and I think that's something that a lot of people don't really realize is that when young people are growing up in this world it's so I think it's a lot more complicated because we've we, it's a lot faster this Absolutely. world this new world fast-paced and you're expected to keep up with this Budum, 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 budum. Um, the even the you're expected to make decisions about your life um, when you're 14, 13, 14. Yeah. Uh, it's like of how in, you, the rest of your life is going to go on, and it, it's all very quick paced. That in the first twenty years of your life, um, you set out what the next. 80 years are going to be and uh, sorry I'm going off on a tangent you're absolutely <laughs> fine Dara you're doing yeah. really well um on that and actually we're coming into kind of the last 10 minutes of this in conversation session and just to bring you into um the audience side of things now um we've got loads of agreement about kids in the outdoors um comments like it appears that parents are encouraged to protect their children from the dangers of nature rather than pushing out to explore the beauty of it. Um, we've got a really nice question here actually from Fergal O'Quinnigan in Mayo, um, who himself does a lot of work um, in conservation. Um, so he says, hi Dara, how do you see conservation in Ireland and Northern Ireland in 20 years from now? And I know that that's a very loaded <laughs> and big question um, because it's dependent a lot on what we do yeah. now. But I think to put it out to both of you um, in terms of a final comment there, what would you think it should be in 20 years time and how do we get there? So we'll come to Dara first and then Aina, I'll hand over to you to close out. Okay, so uh, I'm no prophet or oracle. Um, so I, I, don't really, <laughs> I don't really know 
the um, how because there's so many different variables of how things can change and that all relies on the people and the politicians and how everything turns out because we're not even certain about how our world will be changing it's all so unknown behind this fog this um that is the future and we're sort of seeing shapes in the distance that are kind of vague and we can sort of see um, the big monster of climate change and the massive brick walls of biodiversity loss and we can't really see them but we know that they're there and out there somewhere and we're sort of trying to forge our way forward and if we take this one little teetering step off the correct path then we may fall into an oblivion which is not uh, pleasant um <laughs> you've got it's like walking into a misty forest at night and you've got no idea whether or not you're going to trip on a root or whack it yourself into a tree um uh and but we need as a conservation movement to put forward plans for those next 20 years so we can make sure that maybe 20 or 50 or 100 years down the line that we're still putting forward these conservation measures to make sure that if we ever solve these crises that are facing us at the moment that they won't come back again um and in 20 years we're going to see what exactly is going to happen whether or not as a human race, we're going to fail or we're going to do good. And Brilliantly said there, Dara. Um, I'll hand over to you there, okay. Aina, just on the same question. This is something that I personally could have a conversation with you both for hours about. So just coming in um, before I let you close out there, Aina, to mention that both of you have big news coming up in the way of books. Um, Dara, I know that there is going to be some big news next week. So um, keep an eye on Dara's Twitter is very active there um, in terms of the book side of things. And Aina also has a book coming out in March next year. Um, I mentioned the title of that at the beginning, which is Our Wild World from the Birds and the Bees to the Boglands and the Ice Caps. And as someone who's a pure bogland advocate, I can get behind that as well. So to hand over to you, what would you see as your vision for the future for the next 20 years? Well, I don't know. Sometimes I think I'm glad I'll be gone because I love the way that Dara is an optimist and young people have to be optimistic. But I don't know. I mean, we have 11 percent of the country covered in trees and the country is polarized, whether we love them or hate them. We should have much more forestry. Will we have more in 20 years time or will there be appeals against everything? We shouldn't be burning coal and fossil fuels. We can, we can put up windmills, but then we have NIMBY saying we don't like the look of those as if you prefer the coal burning station. So there's always people at the moment who do not see the big picture, who just see their own personal comforts being affected by the world around them. So it really is a case where old dinosaurs who are doing this should move over and nearly there should be a law saying nobody should be making decisions about things unless they have walked a mile in the moccasin of the person living there. It's better. I'm 40 years at this job. I was president of Antashka in my time and things are better than they were 40 years ago. So I must say that at any rate, um, there's more awareness of the implications of development on the environment around. There's more environmental impact studies. There's more environmental legislation, more great at legislation. So I suppose we have to just hope that more and more people will want these laws that are there because we're great at making laws, that more and more people will want these to be enforced and will want their environment to be better than it is and won't see it that it's a personal affront to them if they can't see the view because there's a woodland in the way or they can't build a, a house in the field where the drainage is impossible because the water table is wrong and that the common good trumps the personal good. So on that note, I suppose the glass half full is always better than the glass half empty and the more people like Darren people like me, people who write books, David Attenborough, Greta Thunberg, the more everybody is singing from the hymn, same hymn sheet, publishing stuff, getting it there, the more, or rather the less excuse there is for it not to happen. So I suppose one must be optimistic because otherwise there's no point at all, is there? So it can be great. In 20 years time, the place will be wonderful. And, and be with it. on that note, um, just to kind of close out completely, 
Guys, this was a very inspirational talk. I think anyone involved, if you just look at the comments, um, their minds are blown. Dara, you've achieved so much at such a young age. I mean, I am of twice that age and I haven't achieved half as much. So you're doing incredibly well. Not only that, but I've learned throughout this day. I love the quote, all children are born naturalists. I think that is in essence what humans are as animals, as people. Um, we need to take action. We need conservation. We need to make sure that we're allies to young people who are fighting for causes like this. So on that note, Dara has an incredibly active Twitter account. Make sure you follow it. Keep an eye out for the books that are coming out. And it was absolutely fantastic to host this today. So thanks a million both Aina and Dara. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thanks, folks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.